I'm not trying to be anyone's savior. Uh, that is not the, I, I, I'm just, just trying to think about the future and not be sad. <laughs> to give you an example, the LA subway extension, uh, which is, a, I think it's a two and a half mile extension that was just completed for $2 billion. So it's roughly a billion dollars a mile to do the, the subway extension in, in LA. And this is not the highest utility subway in the world. Um, so, it, yeah, it's quite difficult to dig tunnels normally. I think we need to have at least a tenfold improvement in the cost per mile of tunneling. And how could you achieve that? I guess, actually, if, if you just do two things, you can get to approximately an order of magnitude improvement. Uh, and another thing you can go beyond that. So the, the first thing to do is to cut the tunnel, tunnel diameter uh, by a factor of two or more. So, to, so a single road lane tunnel, would, uh, uh, according to regulations, has to be 26 feet, maybe 28 feet in diameter to allow for crashes and emergency vehicles um, and sufficient ventilation uh, for uh, combustion engine cars. But if you, if you shrink that diameter to what, what, what we're attempting, which is t uh, 12 feet, which is plenty to get an electric skate through, uh, you drop the, uh, the diameter by a factor of two and the cross-sectional area by, by a factor of four, so, uh, and the, the tunneling cost scales with the cross-sectional area. So that's roughly a half order of magnitude improvement right there. Then tunneling machines uh, currently tunnel for half the time, then they stop, and then the, the rest of the time is putting in reinforcements for the tunnel wall. So if you have, if you design the machine instead to do continuous tunneling and reinforcing, that'll give you a factor of two improvement. Combine that and it's a factor of eight. Uh, also, these machines are far from at being at their, their power or thermal limit. So you can jack up the power to the machine substantially. I think you can get at least a factor of two, maybe a, a factor of four or five improvement on, the, on top of that. We built a Hyperloop test track adjacent to SpaceX just for a student competition uh, to encourage innovative ideas in transport. Um, it, it actually ends up being the, uh, the, the biggest um, vacuum chamber in the world after the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, by, by volume, so, um, so, so it, it was, it's, was sort of quite, quite fun to do that, uh, but it was kind of a hobby thing. And, and then um, we, we think we might, so we developed a little pusher car to push these, the, the, the student pods, um, but we're gonna try seeing how fast we can make the, the pusher go if it's not pushing something. <laughs> so, I mean, like, sort of cautiously optimistic, we'll be able to be faster than a uh, the, the world's fastest bullet train, even in, in a 0.8 mile stretch. I, I think the like if you were to do something like um, a DC to New York uh, hyperloop, I think you'd probably want to go underground the entire way because it's a high density area. This you're going, you're going um, under a lot of buildings and houses, and if you go deep enough, you cannot detect the tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, this is sometimes people think, well, it's going to be pretty annoying to have. The tunnel dug under my house. Like if that tunnel is dug more than about three or four tunnel diameters beneath your house, you will not be able to detect it being dug at all. Mm. Um, in, fa in fact, like the, um, if you if you're able to detect the tunnel being being dug, you whatever device you're using, you can get a lot of money for that device from the Israeli military who is trying to detect tunnels from Hamas, um, <laughs> and uh, from the U.S. Uh, Customs and Border Patrol that trying to detect drug tunnels. So uh, if you, the, the reality is that uh, Earth is incredibly good at absorbing vibrations. And once the tunnel depth is below a certain level, it is undetectable. If maybe you have a very sensitive seismic instrument, you might be able to detect it. A lot, a lot of people think that once, when you make cars autonomous, that they'll be able to go faster and that will alleviate congestion. Um, and to some degree that will be true. Uh, but once you have shared autonomy where it's much cheaper to go by car, and you can go point to point. Um, the affordability of, of of going in a car will be will be better than that of a bus. Like it'll cost less than a bus ticket. So, um, the amount of driving that'll occur will be much greater with shared autonomy, and actually traffic will get far worse. But the, so the, the the real trick of it is not, you know, how do you make it work? Say ninety nine point nine percent of the time, because like. like if, if a car crashes, say, one in a thousand times, then it, you're probably still not going to be comfortable falling asleep. Um, that, that's, 
you know, you shouldn't be, certainly. <laughs> um, so, so, but it's, but it's, it's not going to be, it's never going to be perfect. No system is going to be perfect. But if you say it's perhaps, um, it's, it, it, the, the car is unlikely to crash in a hundred lifetimes or a thousand lifetimes, then people are like, okay, wow, if I would live a thousand lives, I would still most likely never experience a crash, then that's probably okay. So th there will be a shared autonomy fleet where you buy your car and you can choose to use that car exclusively. Um, you could choose to um, have it be used only by friends and family, only by uh, five star, uh, other drivers who are rated five star. You can choose to uh, share it sometimes, but not other times. Um, that's 100% that's, that's what will occur. It's just a question of when. So this is a, a heavy duty, long range semi truck. So it's like the uh, highest uh, weight capability um, and, and with long range. Um, so, so essentially it's meant to um, alleviate the, the, the heavy duty trucking loads. Um, and this is something which uh, people do not today think is possible to think the truck doesn't have enough power or it doesn't have enough range. Um, and then with this, with the Tesla Semi, we want to show that you no, know, an electric truck actually can out torque uh, any diesel uh, Semi. Um, and you know, put, put, if, if you had a tug of war competition, the, the, like the Tesla Semi will, will tug the, the diesel Semi uphill. Yeah, the, so the, the solar gas tiles where you can, you, um, you can adjust the texture and the color uh, at a very fine grained level. Um, and then uh, th there's sort of micro louvers uh, in, uh, in, in the glass, such that um, when you're looking at the roof from street level or close to street level, all the tiles look, w w the tiles look the same whether there is a solar panel behind it or a, so a solar cell behind it or not. Um, so you, you have an even, um, even color from, from um, the ground level. If you were to look at it from a helicopter, you, you would be actually able to look through and see that some of the, the glass tiles have uh, a solar cell behind them and some do not. We're very confident that the cost of the roof uh, uh, plus the cost of electricity, uh, the, the, that, this, that, that a solar glass roof will be less than the cost of a normal roof plus the, the cost of electricity. So in other words, um, this will be uh, economically a no-brainer. Um, it will look, we think it'll look great um, and it will last, I mean, we, we thought about like having the, the, the warranty be infinity, um, but then people thought, well, that might sound like we were just talking rubbish, but the, actually, <laughs> the, the like the this is like t this is tough and glass. Like well after the house has collapsed um, and there's nothing there, the roof will tie the glass tiles will still be there. Now, now that, the, the thing is to, to consider the time scale here to be probably on the order of forty or fifty years. So on, on average, a roof is replaced every twenty to twenty-five years. So, um, but you don't, you don't start replacing all roofs immediately. Uh, but eventually, if you say we were to fast forward to say 15 years from now, it will be unusual to have a roof that does not have solar. Yeah, we landed the rock booster um, and then prepped it for flight again and flew it, flew it again. So it's the, it's the first reflight of, uh, of, of an orbital, orbital booster where, where that reflight is relevant. So it's important to, to appreciate that reusability is only relevant if it is rapid, um, rapid and complete. Right. Uh, so like an aircraft or a car, uh, the, the reusability is rapid and complete. Uh, you do not send your aircraft into to, to Boeing in between flights.